You're now watching Sports Better's Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network. All right, Jimmy, out along with Paul Stone each and every week, giving out his college football best bets, breaking them down like nobody can. Let's get to it. And, well, you know, a lot of people say the best football is being played in the Pac-12 so far this year. Let's get to it. we got a three-pack of uh, Pac-12 teams, five total bets uh, for this week of Paul Stone's uh, ticket. Let's go to Utah, Oregon. In Utah, I mean, Cam Rising, well, He's expected to play against Florida on that Thursday night opener. He, well, he's now been announced a, a done for the season. So never did recover properly from that uh, that ACL that he tore in the January 1st Rose Bowl loss against Penn State. Gone to Eugene here to uh, take on the Oregon Ducks. Uh, Ducks minus seven against the Utes. You know, first of all, I think it, it's clearly going to be somewhat of a challenge for Utah's players and coaches to reload their mental and physical tanks after that uh, 34, 20, uh, 32 victory at Southern Cal on Saturday night. What a what a football game. Uh, the Utes win on a game-ending field goal. You know, there was just so much uh, energy, emotion, and effort uh, expended on the floor of the L.A. Coliseum. It's difficult for these college football teams to, to just regenerate uh, and recreate that type of energy. So sometimes you see a little bit of drop-off. And there's no time for drop-off, obviously, with the Oregon Ducks coming into town, eighth-ranked Oregon. But I think Utah can do it. First of all, you've got ESPN's college game day there for only the fifth time in school history in Salt Lake City, the first time since 2016. Uh, Cal Winningham, you know, it's just it's a tough ask, first of all, again. I can't, uh, you know, say that enough. But it's just so difficult for me to doubt Cal Winningham. I truly think with the resources that he's got, with the historical uh, posture of the program, the job that he does year in and year out, and especially this year, Utah, I think they probably had more injuries than any Power 5 team in the country, especially on the offensive side. Uh, you mentioned quarterback Cam Rising hasn't played all year, won't play all year. Tight end Brant Keithy, a big-time tight end, hasn't played all year, won't play all year. Many other receivers, many other players, again, primarily on offense. They've got a pig farmer slash walk-on playing quarterback. Uh, they've got a strong safety, uh, Sione Vaki, uh, who's playing running back, and he's going out to wide receiver. Looks like an all-pro wide receiver. It's just amazing, again, what Whittingham does with uh, what he has uh, at his disposal. And this is a, this is a big-time program. I actually made this line two and a half. Uh, Oregon favored wow. by two and a half. So to get seven, I think there's some bonus points in there. I like the use plus seven over Oregon. I apologize about saying you know, the location. This, of course, is at Rice Eccles Stadium because, I mean, the home and away splits, I mean, for Utah is really, really strong. I mean, they are – it's it's as it's as much of a home uh, home field advantage that I can uh, I can think of. I mean, it is really extreme. So, yeah, and uh, and Utah probably di shouldn't have need the last uh, minute uh, dramatics, you know, to 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 get the to set up for the game winning field goal. They were much the best for the big part of that game uh, in the Coliseum, and yeah, I mean, just set up again for you know back to back. Uh, defending uh, Pac-12 champions going for another one this year in the driver's seat uh, for a spot as a no divisional play this year in the Pac-12. Their last year, the Pac-12, just the top two teams will get that invite. So again, Utah at home plus seven against the Oregon Ducks. Get extra value this football season with Bet River Squares. Went up to $10,000 in bonus money. Bet $10 in same game parlays on any game with the Squares icon to earn a square. That's brought to you by our friends at Bet Rivers, let's stay in the Pac-12. Go to Tempe, Arizona. You want to talk about a, another good coaching job and getting the most out of it and figuring some things out. Arizona State, after a, a really tough gut punch by their administration right before the start of the season, nope, no bowl game uh, for you this year. So Arizona State has had to do some things to get uh, right. They have been much more competitive than anybody thought, especially in Seattle where – Man, a 95-yard pick six turned everything around. They could have easily won uh, outright as a 28-point dog. Catch it six and a half at home against Washington State. Yeah, I'm glad you you notice uh, because a lot of people probably don't. They probably look at Arizona State's one and six record and they don't uh, realize 
the job that 33-year-old Kenny Dillingham has done in his first year as Arizona State's head coach. I mean, as you know, all college football teams don't get the same size stick. You know, different teams have different historical uh, past. They have different levels of resource, recruiting bases, so forth and so on. In Arizona State, uh, Dillingham, frankly, inherited quite a mess from uh, his predecessor, uh, Herm Edwards. Yeah. Their Power Five talent, they don't have many players, really, that are big-time frontline Power Five starters. They just don't. So he's really had to struggle, Dillingham has, in his first year. But, man, they, they're one in six, but they have really fought, scratched, and clawed, especially the last month. They are very competitive. They're off that 15-7 to seven disappointing loss in Seattle to playoff contender Washington. And you mentioned it, but, you know, Arizona State's got the ball first and 10 from the Washington 19. Defensive holding called against Washington. The officials huddle. They get together. They wave off the flag. A couple of plays later, they throw the interception. Washington returns it for the touchdown, and that's pretty much game over. The Sun Devils, they've covered four straight three of those covers by double digits. So I just like where they are. Again, they're fighting. They've got a great resolve. I like Arizona State plus the points over Washington State. Paul, what what number did you have on that Colorado game where they lost 27-24 at home? Because that uh, that is, um, you know, they, they you get the good number there. That's four covers in a row uh, for Arizona State, and they really have not been close. You know, uh, so catching a bunch of points against USC, I mean, California, Colorado, uh, and again against Washington, where they could have won the game outright. In a weekend where college and pro, where uh, money line parlays were busted up to uh, no no, no end, that was another one uh, that could have been busted up as well. Absolutely, yeah. That game closed at three and a half, and I think okay. a lot of people got the money with Arizona State, so I am counting that as four straight covers. And as you just kind of alluded to, Jimmy, I think it's important to note, and it's hard to determine which will be the teams that will surprise and perhaps even upset one of these heavyweights. But this late October to mid-November window, crazy things happen every year. These college teams have been practicing since around August 1st. They're running out of emotional juice. Uh, They're getting tired mentally. Injuries are starting to pile up, so forth and so on. They're looking ahead. They're looking behind. And uh, they get caught napping. So something, you know, we're, we're coming up. This is going to be uh, this Saturday, Saturday, October 28th. Something crazy is going to happen this summer. Uh, it's up to us to hopefully uncover one or two of those games. All right. Uh, let's stay in the Pac-12 and stay at the Coliseum. You're talking about crazy. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to Berkeley again uh, the, with the USC traveling uh, to Berkeley. And uh, you talk about strange things happening at USC. This is the big NIL, uh, number two media market budget team. Huh? They're supposed to be in front of the cameras all the time. Well, none of the players were made available to the media after the loss uh, to uh, Utah on Saturday night. Lincoln Riley gets sick, a little under the weather, for his coach's show this week as well. So can't find anybody from USC all of a sudden after a couple of tough losses. Travel to Berkeley. Uh, there, uh, USC laying 11 on the road at Cal. You know, I kind of worry about these teams, and we can use this to our benefit as handicappers, but I worry about these teams. I like to say their house is built on the foundation of NIL. I think USC is one of those teams. Uh, one could argue, you know, maybe Texas a and M's uh, one of those teams as <laughs> Absolutely, well. Absolutely, Texas and others, A&M, yeah. Certainly could be considered in that. And I just don't think it's a strong foundation. And you've got a USC team. They've now lost two straight games, lost to Notre Dame on the road uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then, as we've already talked about, losing home to USC. And they're lucky it's not a three-game losing streak. Uh, Arizona, the week before that, had them on the ropes before losing in triple overtime. So these uh, these Trojans are starting to fade a little bit. And clearly, their primarily primary goal, rather, entering the season was to make the 14 playoff. That was probably all other goals that they had as a team paled in comparison. And that goal is certainly now off the table. And they're likely physically and emotionally and in every other, you know, method possible spent uh, after that crushing 34-32 loss to Utah. They really don't like Utah. They hadn't been able to beat Utah recently. And uh, Lincoln Riley, he, he quote something to the effect, my most difficult loss ever, you know, so it was a very, very difficult loss. Cal, fair to say, they have not been world beaters this year, but the Golden Bears are fresh. They're at home. They're off their bye. 
Justin Wilcox has really been good uh, as an underdog since taking over in 2017. Uh, he is actually 27 and 18 against the spread as the betting underdog. We're getting double digits here. 11 a lot of points. I think his Trojan team's a little bit limp. I think they're a little bit spent. We'll take the points with Cal over USC. All right, uh, let's move to the south. In uh, again, three straight, uh, three straight uh, road dog. I'm sorry, home dogs in the Pac-12 uh, for Paul Stone this uh, this week. So get uh, get my locations right. But yes, uh, three home dogs uh, in the Pac-12 this week. South Alabama and ULL. You know, South Alabama is sort of the new kid on the block down in the mid-major South uh, Department. Just started football not too long ago. Only about an hour and a half drive from Hattiesburg, and they just tr- they tried to beat the Southern Miss. Oh, it's it's a sad what's happened to that program. SEC schools used to dodge Southern Miss at once upon a time 30, 40 years ago. But South Alabama beat them as possibly bad as they could. Now they're at home again, back home at that new stadium, minus 10 against the Raging Cajuns of University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Yeah, South Alabama, first of all, in uh, the spirit of full disclosure, they've certainly had a couple of stinkers this year, to put it uh, bluntly. You know, that much-anticipated season opener at Tulane, they end up losing by 20 points, weren't very competitive. And then inexplicably, a few weeks ago, I think on September 23rd, they lose to uh, Mac Middlefeeder, uh, Central Michigan, 34-30 at home as a 16-point favorite. Uh, but they've got South Alabama. They've got an experienced and talented quarterback in uh, Carter Bradley. It is a high-powered South Alabama offense. They average 35.5 points per game. They rank 12th nationally in scoring, average 6.1 yards per play. So they're very uh, prolific offensively. You look at Louisiana's defense, on the other hand, four of their six FBS opponents this season have scored at least 30 points against the Raging Cajuns. So I expect South Carolina, uh, South Alabama, rather, is going to put up uh, some points, uh, and offensive numbers are going to be, uh, you know, really positive for the Jaguars. You look at uh, specifically the passing game in South Alabama; they rank among the nation's top 25 teams in yards per pass attempt at 8.5 yards per attempt, which is really high. Louisiana Lafayette they don't defend the pass very well; they rank 116 in pass yards uh, defensively per attempt, allowing 8.3. So I think South Alabama and Carter Bradley are going to throw for a lot of yards, going to put up a lot of points, going to win this game by two touchdowns or more. South Alabama minus 10. All right, the Jaguars minus 10 against the Raging Cajuns. One more pick. we got a total here uh, in uh, with the uh, Marshall-Coastal Carolina game. I did a little piece on uh, the Coastal Carolina in – that, uh, man, it's just uh, not the same uh, without the head coach. So, Grayson called. I did stay, but Jamie Chadwell went on to Liberty. By the way, Liberty is undefeated uh, right now. Marshall is 4-45. Four and 45. Coastal Carolina, that great offense with Chadwell, they've only scored over 30 points one time, and that was against Duquesne, 66-7. to seven. So, this is not the Coastal Carolina of uh, from the the past few years, especially in that COVID year, that we really started to pay attention to them. Yeah, certainly not the same offense that the Chanticleers have had the last couple of years uh, with Chadwell and all now gone uh, up to Liberty. But uh, it is a better defensive team, I think, and that's part of our uh, handicap here. And to to be uh, honest about it, there's nothing really extremely sophisticated about my handicap of this total. Marshall's likely once again going to be without several key players, uh, most notably running back Rasheen Ali, who rushed for more than 1,400 yards uh, back in 2021, has 641 yards rushing this season, despite missing last week's game against James Madison. Uh, His absence would be quite significant for Marshall. He's clearly the focal point of the Thundering Herd's offense. And then as much as Marshall's offense would be impacted if Ali is unable to go, which I don't think he's going to play. Coastal Carolina's missing player on offense would be uh, much more impactful uh, in Grayson McCall. Grayson McCall, um, two-time Sunbelt Player of the Year. Uh, He got injured in that game last week at Arkansas State. Kind of a scary situation. Uh, Gets taken off the field on a stretcher, taken to a local hospital there in Jonesboro, uh, reportedly 
in concussion protocol. I think he will almost certainly miss this game against Marshall. So that means that backup Jarrett Guest, who started two games last year, will get the start more than likely against Marshall on Saturday. He's serviceable, but he's not really he's not really even a above average mid major backup in my uh, opinion. Predictably, a significant downgrade uh, from McCall with offensive injuries uh, on both sides. I think points are going to be at a premium. Forty five is a fairly low total. Who would have thought about a total of 45 in a Coastal game last year? But I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of scoring here. So in this Sun Belt matchup, uh, Marshall and Coastal Carolina take under the total of 45. Yeah, the super senior, Grayson McCall, he's had a lot of starts uh, under his belt. There's no doubt about that. Paul, with with some of the games that are being played, though, with the quarterbacks, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a lot. It's not even immune to the military schools now. I mean, out indefinitely turned to starting the game on Saturday in the early uh, the early starts for Air Force against Navy. Would you would you hold out to 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 closer to game time to see exactly when you're basing some of these picks on, on the quarterback going or st- or not going? Yeah, I certainly think, and I think it's kind of on a case by case basis. Jimmy would be the way that I would approach it. I think McCall clearly, since he's in concussion protocol. A guy taking off the field okay. on the stretcher spends a night in the hospital. I just don't think he's going to play. But some of you know some of these other you know it's every situation's individual, and you got to kind of read through the tea leaves. You know, I used to be a, a sports writer and covered major college football for many years in a past life. So you kind of learn you know how coaches are, and you know it's very difficult for us as handicappers without the requirement of a legitimate injury report. You know, coaches are going to play close close to the vest. You know, they don't think it serves their overall purpose to reveal anything about the availability or non-availability of a player, uh, certainly most notably their quarterback. So they're not going to give us a whole lot of uh, information. You mentioned uh, early in this podcast uh, the individual case of Cam Rising. I mean, you know, back like he was week to week starting with that game against Florida, and I said early in the year there's a chance he won't play at all this year. It's just smoke and mirrors, and you never know – the severity of, of a person's injury. You never know their mindset with a potential NFL career on the horizon. There's just so many factors in today's college football landscape, some of which weren't even around three years ago, that are now present and now factor into the equation. So you just got to do your homework, read as many uh, legitimate news sources as you can, and, and try to just go with your, your gut and develop an instinct. It does seem like a, a few more games playing. I guess the outlier is Brian Kelly at LSU, who gives the media every Monday his uh, an NFL style uh, injury report. Doubtful, questionable, probable, out in. Yeah, I mean, so and he's uh, he thinks that uh, he's getting it out there. So maybe some people who are looking for information will kind of leave his players alone. He's going to provide everything for them. Some different ways to handle things because I remember on the same day last year. Dallas, Texas, the game you went to. Well, I mean, Brent Venables dressed out. Dylan Gabriel, he warmed up, had no intention to play. Came out when the game started in street clothes. Same thing in Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, Sam Pittman dressed out, warmed up. K.J. Jefferson, he watches the game in street clothes with no intention to play. So it is uh, it is it is something. I know that some people had uh, Navy and um, – uh, not only did the coach, uh, you know, then the Air Force coach plays games with the head coach, and then the Navy coach goes for two, unexplicably. So anyway, you know, got a little bit of everything, but I've, I've seen, I do see some more kind of things being played a little bit with the availability of quarterbacks. It, it never, it, it seems to be more prevalent. So anyway, no, and nothing, nothing beats information in doing your homework, uh, like Paul Stone does, who looks at all these press conferences, reads all these mag- me, me and all these papers to get the uh, beat writers in their reports uh, on the injury. That's it for us this week. Again, five picks for Paul Stone in college football this week. Each and every week, his best bets right here on the Sports Bears Paradise. For Paul Stone, I'm Jimmy Ott on the Bet Rivers Network. <laughs>